For me, it's been really rough. I think what my, my own version of self-therapy is creating art. I found that that's the only thing that kind of gives me peace in my mind. Um, emotionally, it makes me peaceful because there was one point where I just shut off all social media. I wasn't really posting anything. I wasn't trying to look at anything. So that's kind of where my head was at. It, it had become a source of stress for me. You know, and it's, this is one of those things that has been ongoing and been going on for a long time, but I've always been pretty good with uh, keeping that separated from like the way I feel internally. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to episode three of Change of Art uh, here with uh, Nate D at Miami. Nate, what's up, Nate? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are things on your end? It's, it's, it, we're, we're doing it, you know, we're making it through. This is a clearly a, a crazy time. We are here to really uh, amplify the voices that matter. That's, that's what we're doing. And that's why, you know, I wanted to talk to you today. Um, a little bit of background, Nate, we go way back, uh, probably, geez, five, six years at this point now. Yeah. From uh, Serge uh, introducing us to, to each other and then getting the opportunity to work together on many projects uh, with the Dolphins and just throughout Miami. Um, but, but I just wanted to take some time uh, on this show to, to catch up and, and to talk about what you're doing, what you're painting, how are you doing now um, with, with everything that's going on. And um, so I really wanted to start out um, with a question about, you know, street art really does have its roots in activism. Right. And that's 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 really where it started. Um, how can how can street art be used or how do you use street art to amplify voices that matter, but but may not really have a platform? I think with me, especially uh, I, I personally um, really strive to create work that reflects the communities that it lives in. You know, so usually if I have a project, I'll talk to people in the neighborhood. I'll talk to the stakeholders. I'll talk to, if it's a building owner, I'll talk to the building owner, get his perspective on the way things are in that area. Um, I'll talk to people in the neighborhood. I'll talk to random people just walking by. And I use all these things to inform the, uh, I guess, the theme that I, that I create around the mural. So a lot of the times I really don't know what I'm going to do when people first call me to do a piece until I start researching the area where it's going to be at. And I start talking to people who are in that area. So it gives me an idea of where I want to go with the piece. Who are some of the people? Like, what's some examples that you can use of, of people that you talk to? Um, the, the one school mural that you did recently, um, that there was a great, uh, you, you put a great time-lapse video on. Um, it, tell me about your process behind that piece. It was super powerful and super impactful. Okay, that was the one that I did for Mary. It was, it was for a school. The school was uh, Mary M. Bethune Elementary yep. School. So the person running the project, her name is Jill Weisberg, and she also runs the Downtown Hollywood Mural Project. So she had already had me slated to start a mural in Hollywood after this whole quarantine happened and everything kind of shut down. This other project fell in her lap and she said, well, since Nate's sitting around waiting to start this Hollywood mural, let's see if you'd be interested in doing this piece. So then she first came to me and told me about it. And then... With me, I personally don't like to do well-known people. I like to do local people or just people I know. I'll include them in the murals, even if uh, the mural isn't really about them, but I'll use them as my models and such. But uh, with this one, she told me it was for the school. The school was hoping to do something with uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, just because even though she's, she's a great woman who had a lot of influence in her time, accomplished a lot in her time, and was just amazing when you really read her story. The average kid didn't know who she was that went to school. Mm. And the average, even the average parent that went to school had no idea who she was. So what I did was I talked to the principal of the school. I talked to a couple of teachers of the school. And I also talked to, to specifically Jill, who was uh, the one in charge of the program. And then I went and started doing research about Mary McLeod Bethune. And I, there's even stuff that I learned about it. I knew that she was big in education, but I didn't know that she, she was also had connections to the president at the time. And he would wow. consult her on a lot of things, especially things that dealt with the black community. You know, she had his ear and she was there kind of to guide him through maneuvering with that group in society. Um, she created one of the first schools for women. 
Wow. A lot of people didn't know. She was an activist for women, not just women of color, color but all women. You know, and she had a lot of programs and things like that. Uh, her school eventually uh, it merged with another school that was in Daytona, which became one of the first uh, historically black colleges, which is Bethune Cookman College yep. in Florida. So I took all these things, and then um, I also looked at some of her quotes and read about her, and I used all these things and just um, use them just to create the mural. When you talk about um color and splash that you incorporate into your style. And I've seen that personally evolve um, in, in your style over the past five years. Um, where does that, where does that inspiration come from? Where do you, where do you find to say that I, I, I want to paint the, the splashes around this in this blue? I want to paint, you know, how do you, how do you find the feeling for, for those? And when, where does that come from? Where does that inspiration come from? Well, it's, 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 kind of, it changes from meal to meal. So sometimes it's something that's a little bit more intu intuitive mm -hmm. where um, I'll come up with the colors for the splashes and things after the fact. I'll design the entire piece. And then when I start building the background, um, after I'm done with what the focal point is and the main idea, then I'll look at the colors that are there and I'll choose colors. There are certain colors which are just my favorite colors yeah. um, that, especially for the splashes that I, li I like to settle on a lot of times, it's that electric blue. Yeah. If you look at a lot of my pieces, I throw that electric blue in there. But um, I use it more as a, de uh, as a, um, a device for composition. And okay. it helps to create energy, it helps to create flow. And then it also, there's a couple of nods. So when I first started, I used to do a lot of um, basic shapes and pattern work in the background of my pieces. And it was more of a nod to just my love for graphic design. I'm, I'm traditionally trained as a studio artist and a painter. Uh, I did a concentration in grad school in oil paint, you know? Um, but I've always loved graphic design. You know, I'm in the education system as well, and I teach digital design. So because of that, it was initially a nod to that where I would go in and put the pattern work in there and do hand painted patterns, hand painted yeah. shapes. But then what I did, what really bothered me about it was that it looked good compositionally, but it felt very mechanical. Uh -huh. You know, so then that's when I started going in with the splashes of color, and then I use, and then I take those shapes that I would that what I was initially creating that were geometric and then I'd break up the edges and make it look like they were really wild brush strokes. You know, I call them splashes, but they're really supposed to look like really just huge br wild brush strokes. But I, I love that energy that it created and, and it, it was that human element that was added to the piece that wasn't as mechanical as I felt the shapes looked, but still was a nod to that graphic element because they're still flat areas of color. That's, that's, um, it's powerful. Color is, it has such an impact in, in the oh. choices of colors that we use is, 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 is super important. I think it's just, man, there's so much impact and you do it so well, um, especially you. in your skin tones and your faces and, and, and how they come off and, and the, the animals, you know, that you're, you're painting. And so kudos to you on that. Um, I saw on Facebook, you posted yesterday, um, that you were looking for a wall, um, that was very visible that had mm -hmm. impact so that, that that you could paint something that relates to what's going on in our country right now. Yes. Um, explain to me where your head's at, where, you know, where is it at right now with the events of this past week and what do you want to paint? I mean, it's for me, it's been really rough. I think what my, my own version of self therapy is creating art. I found yeah. that that's the only thing that kind of gives me peace in my mind, um, emotionally, it makes me peaceful because there was one point where I just shut off all social media. I wasn't really posting anything. I wasn't trying to look at anything. So that's kind of where my head was at. It, it had become a source of stress for me, you know, and it's, this is one of those things that has been ongoing and been going on for a long time, but I've always been pretty good with uh, keeping that separated from like the way I feel internally. But yeah, so there's an there's a artist locally he, um, named Mojo. He's a phenomenal artist. Okay. Anyway, he's a black artist just like myself. And um, he came to me with the idea and he was talking. We have friends with some producers at NBC6 and, he, and they were discussing an idea of creating a mural um, about what's going on. And yeah. when he came to me and talked to me about it. I told him I was down, but I told him I don't want to beat a dead horse with this. Like, I don't want to create 
imagery that's shocking. I don't want to create imagery that's kind of just like pouring gasoline on a fire. Sure. I, like we all know what's going on. There's no like like it's good to talk about it. We should talk about it, but talking about it over and over and over again without without focusing on where we go from here right. is I think a waste of time. So I told him, look, as long as we create something that that we focus on either where we go from here, other aspects of the Im of the issue, the idea of hope, things like that, the future, then I'm so down to do this. And he said, yo, that's where I'm at. And it's true, I understand this way. So when you look at his his artwork, you see that in all his work anyway. Yeah. You know? so, um, right now we're just in the, in the phase of just discussing our ideas and doing some sketches. We're hoping to get it done within the next week, but we need to first find a wall. Right. Uh, we also thought that it'd be very important that if we did do it in the Miami community, it would be, it would, it, it would and should be in a community of predominantly color, mm -hmm. people, people of color living there. So right now we're looking at hopefully either Liberty City, Overtown, or Little Haiti. So um, we'll see what happens. So, so far, a lot of people are interested and I'm right. just waiting to hear back. Uh, since I put the call out last night, it's still right. kind of. You know? yeah, it's early, but the great thing about, about social and it, 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 social can stress us out, right? But it also can be this community building thing uh, and, and, and we can reach out and take action quickly um, yeah. with, our, with our social community. You talked about community. You talked about Miami um, and, and Dade and um, even Broward. <clears throat> um, how have you seen Miami come together? Uh, over over this past few weeks, and and are there any pieces that you've seen that have gone up already that have have, have made an impact or have been really have spoken to you? Yeah, so um, Ruben Rubiera put up a piece yep. that I thought was a really powerful piece. So his style of art is um, where he takes the form and deconstructs it, and then shows it from different angle and different angles, and then when he deconstructs it, it's like cut in cross sections. And then those cross sections, you would see color. So, for example, if you saw my arm, it looked like my arm was sliced in pieces and then the pieces would be pulling apart at different angles. And then within those pieces, you'd see color coming out. Mm. So that's his style. So he did one of the Statue of Liberty, which I thought was amazing. Um, he almost finished it last night. And, of course, you're going to have the people who, who don't like to see anything that's going to make them think. So, unfortunately, someone came and threw a bucket of paint on it. Um, Hopefully he's going to fix it. He said that he is going to fix it based on what I saw in his post. But right. so far, that's the only piece that I've seen go up here. Okay. Um, that's dealing with the whole, the current situation. So um, it's a beautiful piece. It's an amazing piece. And he, he's been knocking it out pretty quickly. He, yeah. he started working on it three days ago and he's almost done. That's awesome. Yeah. He's, he's, there's so much power in, in every artist, right? But Ruben has always been one who has, yeah has been able to transform thought into imagery uh, yeah, so yeah. well. Uh, and Ruben, yeah, Ruben, as long as I've known Ruben, he's always amazed me because of the way his mind works, you yeah. know? So like he'll, he'll create an image with a theme for a theme and I'll look at it like, wow, I would have never come up with that idea. And it's just so spot on and so well done. And things he could do anything, no matter what style you tell him to do it and he'll do it in that style and he'll do it well. Yeah. <laughs> you know so i've always been amazed by that 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 mind of his that's just so creative and it's just able to look at things from so many different avenues yeah there's, there's no doubt he's he's one of a kind really yeah um your work in involves this really cool intertwining of animals um yeah. take me to how that started what and 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 what do they mean Right, you know, and yeah. everybody can interpret it differently, right? But yeah. what do you mean when there's a fox on on someone's head, and how does that? How how did you come up with this? Okay, yeah. So with the with the animals, I actually I've started really explaining it lately. Before that, I really didn't want to go into the meeting, not because there wasn't a meeting. Yeah. I just like the pe people to find their own interpretations of the work. Uh, initially, before I was doing this series, I call it the mass series for lack of a better word. Initially, it was an idea of people wearing masks. Now, now it's more of a metaphysical idea where the mask is really more of a representation of an idea and not really someone wearing a physical mask. That's why when you look at them wearing the animal mask, it's not like the eyes are cut out and you can see their eyes. You actually see the animal's eyes. 
and things like that. So initially when I first started, I had a series that I called the quote series. It was pieces based on different quotes that I find when I was reading, if I was listening to music and a quote stood out that I liked, and then I would create imagery based on that. Um, one day I was reading somebody, something where someone was talking about just the experience of growing up in Europe during World War II, mm. and he was in elementary school. So what he said was he was talking about how in elementary school they had to do training on how to wear it properly put on the gas mask for children yeah. because they were always at threat of the Germans coming in and bombing the city. You know, so yeah. when they first gave the kids the gas mask, the kids saw the gas mask and they were afraid of them, and didn't want to put them on. So what they did was they started those talks to them redesigning the gas mask to look like animals, cartoon characters and stuff like that so that the kids could put it on. But the kids actually didn't want to put it on because they were even more scared of it because they thought it was a dead animal. Wow. But I thought that was funny when I read it and interesting, but it, it also gave me this idea of the mask representing protection and in some, in a lot of ways representing power. Yeah. So that's, that's basically where the mask ideas came from. Like the person wearing the mask is channeling into the power that we as people imbue on animals. You know, like for example, if I say a lion, you're going to already think about certain themes that are associated with lion you'll think royal powerful strong the king you know things yep. like that so i started looking and researching animals and frame them within cultural contexts so for example a lion might mean something in our culture but might not mean the same thing in the native american culture sure. or in an east indian culture in the african culture and i started creating pieces that represented that and it was straight from the view of a cultural context at this point now, it's more of a general idea of power and how we channel power. And it's us channeling that power that we have within ourselves, but showing it to the world through the lens or through, through the imagery of that animal. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating how it, how it translates right? On, yeah. onto the canvas and onto the wall. And then it really does make people think. And, and I love that Thank you... you. I love that you 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 didn't want to you know necessarily say that with everything because art is up to interpretation. Um, but what a fascinating backstory! That's that's awesome. Um, Thank you. I want to I want to uh, as we as we get ready to close up, I always like to play a little pod deck roulette. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna shuffle these. I want you to tell me to stop, and we're gonna answer the question that's on it. So whatever. Oh, you're ready. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> uh, stop. This is a good one. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? As an artist, always show up, do what you say, say what you're going to do. Mm. That's what it comes down to. I, and then for me to expound on that, um, there's a lot of amazing artists out there that are not dependable. You right. know, there's a lot of okay artists out there that have a great career that are always getting work and they're always easy. It's because they show up, they do what they're supposed to do. They do what they promise. And, they know that they could, they could, you know, the people hiring them know that at the end of the day, this person is going to come through and, and kill it and do what he says he's going to do. There's been times where I've been actually brought in to curate because I'll do curation for art shows as well. And I've been brought in to curate art shows and I've actually wanted to put in artists that I know are talented and would submit a great piece for the show. And then the organizer will say, oh, is that this person? Yeah. Take them off the list. Go on to the next person. Mm -hmm. I'll say why? No. No, that person's too much of a headache. They're not going to show up. They'll show up two hours late. They won't show the. They won't drop off the piece until the day of. And I've seen it happen, and I can't blame them for that. So I think that that's, among other things, I think that's one of the standouts that I've gotten as a piece of advice. So I've always done my best, not to be seen as a hippy dippy artist, but to see be seen as a professional. It's it's that's it, like. Advice to take for everybody in every aspect of life, right? Yes. Always yes. show up. Always show up. That's awesome, Nate. Well, I want to ask you one last question. You, you, this is a question that I ask everybody on the show, um, all three episodes that we've done so far. Um, but, but you mentioned it in, in your post um, on making a splash uh, on the, the piece that you just finished this week. Um, you mentioned not only self-therapy, which we talked about earlier, but hope and optimism. Um, yeah. what, what gives you hope right now? Uh, the, um, the, the way this younger generation is coming together, I love it. I mean, I grew up in the 90s, and 
as much as the 90s was better than some of the generations before, there was still separations, you know, it's, especially when you see groups of kids. Like, the kids might get along, but you'll see all the kids that look like each other hang out with each other, you know? So I think that it's amazing that you'll go to these protests, and I'm not talking about the ones where it gets all crazy and they're getting, you know, they're, they're, they're there to destroy stuff. But what I've, what I've noticed, the theme with all these protests is the people who are going and actually believe in this cause, they're coming to like the beginning of the protest and then they'll stay for the, the amount of time that the protest is supposed to be and then they'll leave and then it'll de-evolve to this craziness. So what gives me the most hope is those kids that come in the beginning. It's a young crowd. They're young. If you look at it, these are like 20 somethings. These are like um late teens middle 20s maybe late 20s you know but they're getting behind a cause and they're coming together and they have empathy for each other i yeah. love it hmm. i love the fact that there's empathy for the person that doesn't look like you you know and that's what gives me hope that's this awesome generation man. well that is a uh, it's a perfect way to end this conversation i appreciate you and and it's Thank so you. excited to uh the chat we, we it's been way too long first of all yes, phone yes. Search, not today like we need to get on and and, and have a chat with us uh, yeah and, and um but but thank you nate um best of luck in, in this next piece we are going to follow closely i can't wait to see what you do so appreciate thanks you my friend thanks good talking right. to you thanks yes. for having me on yeah we'll talk soon definitely take care